The sounds you hear are blue waves crashing against black volcanic rock. This is the start of October Pod. I dream all that night before visiting the ruins. Dream about him, the stone man. About his great yearning and his eternal isolation. When the dawn breaks, the details of his story drift away like grains of sand in a windstorm. And yet the sadness he leaves behind is pressed into my soul like a handprint. Interior. An island bungalow. Morning. I pull the comforter from my face and watch the ocean waves crash against the formations of black lava on the beach. The hotel bed is comfortable, and I want to luxuriate in it, listening to the sound of the ocean with the morning light dancing on the blue water. (sighs) But my husband snores, drown it out. Slowly, the hollow ache beneath my ribs subsides, and I remember all that I must do. Yet I don't think I can. I'm not strong enough. The walls in the hotel bathroom are thin. And as she showers, Diana hears the happy couple in the room next door. She presses her ear against the wall and listens to their passion and wonders if they're newlyweds. (laughs) Then all the blood rushes to her face and she hastily rinses off. You see, she and the stone man from her dreams are the same, lonely and isolated. Can you hurry up, darling? I need to get a shower soon, too, if we don't want to miss our tour. I know we're on vacation, but I'd feel a little better if I had enough time to shave. Sure, honey. I'm almost done. My husband, Alan never sees me anymore. I open the shower curtain and stand naked before him, streams of warm water dripping from my body. And he looks right through me. He no longer senses or no longer cares to sense how I hunger for touch, a hunger that screams, please love me. But then I remember what I must do. And that's good, I tell myself. Purpose is good purpose to action. Yowch! This water is freezing. Babe, how do you manage to use up all the hot water? I've never heard of a hotel shower that runs out of hot water before. Jesus Christ, Alan. What kind of rat trap hotel did you book Don't us for? start up with that. And this place is a bungalow, not a hotel. And it came highly recommended. We had to start our day together arguing. And that's good too. It's good that in this moment I hate him. (laughs) This will make it all so much easier. Exterior. Ruins. Day. Judges are in disagreement as to which seafaring people made these stone figures. But what we do know is that they were master craftsmen. The characteristics of these stone figures are similar, but not identical, to ritualistic figures produced by Tahitian, Hawaiian, and Maori peoples of the same period. They differ in style and technique in some notable ways. And some appear to depict gods and heroes, who have no analogues in the mythologies of other Pacific cultures. Was it aliens? Do you think that aliens may have helped them carve these? I mean, and that maybe the gods no one can identify are depictions of aliens? (sighs) That's racist! You're being (sighs) racist, lady. Just because white people didn't make them doesn't mean that aliens had to have made them. Excuse me? I wasn't speaking to you. I was asking a question for the tour guide. You obviously aren't an expert. Do you have a PhD in anthropology or ufology? Oh, I don't think so. I paid my hard-earned money for this tour so that I could get some facts. Not take a lot of lip from a low-class skank like you. (gasps) You better watch your tone, bitch. Didn't expect (laughs) anyone to call you out, did you? Well, you got the right one today. 
you call you out? You called me racist. Right I was just asking that. a goddamn question. Oh. That's all I was doing. Oh. And here you go. You just Sis, go take it you, off. You need have to, to get involved in everybody's home. conversation. You, need to you think home. you're better you than everybody else? The real you're world, not. Like I said, home. you're a sit low your class couch, skank. Sit. You know what? Here I am. I'm a skank. I'm going to ask questions. Stay. She's a skank. No, you are a. Shut up. Shut up. Get off this tour. Excuse me, tour. You get tour guide. Phone. Tour guide. You, you, you need to get her to go. I I'm telling you. Folks, if you come this way, I'll show you the largest and oldest surviving wooden tiki on this island. It is believed to have been carved to commemorate the wedding of the chief's daughter, and perhaps used as part of her dowry. Alan follows the tour guide onto the next exhibit, oblivious of the fact that they've left me behind. I can't force my legs to move, can't make myself stay by his side. I'm so scared of the task ahead. I'm not strong enough. So I linger among this collection of stone statues, ranging in size from 6 to 13 feet tall, guarding this holy place like great unflinching sentinels. And I finally feel alive in the shadows of these vibrant deities. Come to me. You are so close now. What? What's that? I glance over my shoulder but cannot see to whom the strange voice belongs. Cold air tickles my neck and arms and I know that it's him. A stone man for my dream. My spine shudders in anticipation. I find him easily. As if I'd traveled the path through the maze of figures a hundred times before. He stands alone, out of sight from the other stone figures, shrouded by wild growths of tropical foliage. The expression on his face of lava seems strange in the diffused sunlight. His eyes are asymmetrical in the shape and cast with deep shadows, like bottomless pits. His nose, a triangle divot that reminds me of a jack-o'-lantern. His mouth, though, <laughs> that is what draws me closer. Not exactly a smile or a frown. It stretches across his face in a wide swoop, like a cresting wave. I close my eyes and can still see his expression, burned in the back of my eyelids. Stray visitors, stragglers from other tour groups, walk towards the stone man. They shake their heads, perhaps rub their arms or giggle in discomfort, and then walk away. Yes, I understand their reaction. But unlike them, I can sense the longing that throbs and pulsates inside the stone. How he aches to be touched by human hands. The others who see him are frightened of him, not me. I do not fear him, but I fear what I must do. I gather my courage so that I can force my hands into action when the time comes. You cannot imagine the cold and the darkness I've endured. After centuries, you've come for me, my Diana, my beloved. I'm here, my lover. I'm here for you. I showed them the way before, hundreds of years ago. I showed the men the way to dig me up. And today, I will show you the way. I will show you the way for us to be together. Together. Together, forever. Our love will be unending and everlasting. People approach again and I take out my phone, making a charade of photographing the stone man. Please touch me. Please. When the people step away, I drop my phone onto the ground and stretch out my hand. I caress the smooth lava that forms his forehead and rub the ridge above his eyes. Oh, you do feel me, don't you? Hey, babe! Diana! I've been looking everywhere for you. What are you doing all the way back here? I wipe a tear from my cheek and press my hands against the stone in the place where his heart should be. Babe! Uh-huh? Snap out of it. What? You're miles away. Come on! Let's catch up. All right, Alan. Whatever you say. A 
I'm silent the whole ride back to our hotel. Alan doesn't seem to notice. (laughs) Or care. But I'm so lost in my own thoughts. We pass a beach park and I press my face against the window and stare at the crashing waves and see the stone man's stark, uneven features reflected in the surface of the choppy water. I know you're here. I know you're always with me, my beloved. We turn onto the street that leads up to our hotel, to our bungalow, as Alan would say, and now I see his face everywhere. Once, twice, three times on the surface of the storefront windows. His power to be everywhere, to me, all at once is frightening. But I'm comforted that he wants to follow me home, to be near me, knowing as he does what I must do. I feel safe under his gaze. I fall asleep on the giant king bed alone as I stare at the sliding glass door that separates my bed from the beach. It's coated with the ocean spray. I watch the stone man's face sketch itself into the moisture of the glass. Alan doesn't hear me gasp in shock at the sight. He's at the little desk at the foot of the bed and doesn't even look up from the movie he's watching on his laptop. I hate the light from the fucking thing. It's always keeping me up at night but he doesn't care i pull the comforter over my head to block out the light and drift off to sleep my last thought is of my beloved his crooked frown and sad dark eyes my beloved and i knew each other as children and grew up together, playing in each other's shadows. When I was six, my father taught me to fish, using the methods of our ancestors. I was an apt pupil, and soon surpassed my father as a fisherman. I fished waters far deeper than he ever dared to fish. I was the first of my people to fish them, I discovered many things in the deep, some things I dare not speak of. Through the years my love for her endured. She was beautiful and graceful, a dancer. When we came of age, I made her my wife, and she insisted that I teach her how to fish, that I share with her the secret of the deep waters. Deep, deep is my love. And the deep demands her sacrifice. The greater the love, the greater the sacrifice. Interior, bungalow, night. my love. I know what I must do. Alan is asleep at the desk, and the laptop illuminates his fat face with a spectral pale glow. I will my hands to action. I pull off the comforter, step out of my nightgown, and watch the mirror as my naked form slinks up behind him. Alan? Alan? Wake up, darling. What? Babe? Look how the moonlight's dancing on the face of the water. Isn't it glorious? Come on, let's slip out for a midnight swim. He takes more persuading than I expected, which hurts. A little. But it won't be long now. We hold hands and walk naked onto the beach in the moonlight. I tease him and lead him up the beach to the outcropping of the volcanic rock. I'm up here! He's taking the bait. Good. There's a stone knife in my hand. Sharp. Glassy. Obsidian. I do not remember how it came to be with me, but I know it is a gift from my beloved. Babe! Let me catch up. 
deep. Deep is my love, and the deep demands her sacrifice. The greater the love, the greater the sacrifice. Diana, I thought we were going for a swim. We shouldn't be up here on the rocks. Dangerous. And do you know? Oh. Ah. That was the last word my husband spoke. Dangerous? <laughs> He collapses hard onto the rocks and disappears in the foam of the crashing waves. There will be police here when he finally washes up. But it's no matter. This is just another end I foresee, as certain as the rising of the sun. The face of my beloved appears on the horizon, beckoning me far out to sea, beckoning me to the deep, where we may finally be together. Together with love everlasting. Deep, deep is my love, and the deep could demand sacrifice. The greater the love, the greater the sacrifice. Exterior. Ruins. Morning. No one hears from Alan and Diana again, though several weeks will pass before relatives back east begin to make inquiries. In a dark, unkempt corner of the island ruins, tour guides, preparing for the morning influx of tourists, discover the figure of a stone woman next to the nameless stone man diana had been seen fondling the day before this stone woman is a sad gaunt figure her arms are stretched out in front of her as if begging for something the ground beneath the figures looks undisturbed as though both the stone man and the stone woman had always been there Hey there, friend. My name's Sarai, and I host a spooky, casual podcast called Freaky AF, where I tell you stories of conspiracies, true crime, and of the supernatural. So if that's your kind of shiz, come check us out. I'm sure we'll be great friends. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker, and a bunch of other places. Or you can look us up on Twitter and Instagram, where Freaky AF Pod, that's F R E A. K-Y-A-F-P-O-D. Come get spooked, y'all. I'm Annie from Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm Johanna from Vienna, Austria. We are the hosts of Fresh Hell, your international podcast that covers murder, mystery, and the macabre throughout history. Are you interested in the 3,569 ways your household could have killed you in the Victorian era? Do you know how malaria and syphilis played a role in the John List family murders? And have you ever wondered what Prince Albert's sex chair had to do with the murder of Stanford White? Okay, nothing. It had nothing to do with it. We're still telling you about it, though. It's a pretty great sex chair. If you're looking for another show that talks about Ted Bundy, this is probably not the podcast for you. But if you're looking for two women that cover lesser-known cases from all over the world with a lot of background information... So much background information that you will rock your local pub quiz from now on. Then find Fresh Hell Podcast on your favorite podcast app. We also have German cannibals. See you soon. Tschüss. Welcome to Brew Crime, a true crime and beer podcast. This is a podcast where we pick a theme, cover a few cases, and pair them with craft beer. Join me, Mike. And me, JT. As we explore the world of crime, conspiracies, or whatever catches our attention. You can find us on social media at BrewCrime or our website, BrewCrime.com. And you can find us on any podcast app at BrewCrime Podcast. Join us as we discuss the horrible crimes that surround us and maybe, eh, probably, not definitely tip a bottle or two back as you do it. Drink with us the second and last Tuesday of every month.
I'm Edward October. For more true, true true-ish, and classic tales of horror and the paranormal, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Be sure to ring the bell so you don't miss anything. Or find all of our links at octoberpodvhs.com. Octoberpod. Retro horror for bold individualists.